who are, as you've seen, we've had a lot of uh, business shuffling back and forth, so it would be very good that if you have a presentation prepared, if you let the chair of your session know, or Larry or Arnie or Pete know what AV equipment you need, we can do that a little more uh, swiftly. Um, I just want to take a second to introduce Paul Zeitz, who um, was a member of the first IMO team and um, has been training for a decade and a half or something. You've been a trainer for some time? Just a few years. Just a few years, but. Uh, and was, uh, along with uh, Zvezda, the, um, one of the motive forces of the birth of the Berkeley Math Circle in the Bay Area Mathematical Olympiad. Here, he is professor of mathematics and chair of the Department of Mathematics at the University of San Francisco. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, um, uh, this is uh, mid afternoon, so this is nap time for all of us who aren't standing, I think. And uh, one of the ways we'll try to defacilitate that is by having our speakers in this uh, panel speak a little more quickly and leave some time for audience participation. And uh, that's at least our hope. We, we're going to go till about four. And uh, we also invite uh, audience members to ask questions that they might have wanted to ask people earlier uh, today since you, you haven't had that chance. And so feel, feel free to, you know, talk about whatever you want because, you know, uh, basically that's the whole point of this uh, conference, really. Um, and uh, speaking of open-endedness, the, the, the title of this session is, is kind of vague. And, uh, you know, uh, I, can't e I have to reread it each time. Discussion of various approaches and possible adaptations. And you might say, well, that could mean practically anything. And uh, that's what it does. And, the <laughs> um, and therefore, we have three speakers that uh, work in very, very different venues uh, in terms of the difference between local and global and uh, type of audience approached. And uh, you could also argue that uh, none of them directly are doing math circles or math olympiads, but they certainly are doing things that are adaptations or various approaches within this realm. We're going to go in alphabetical order. So uh, the first person that's uh, going to be up is uh, Joe Gallion, whom uh, I think most of you know of or uh, have uh, used his, where is Joe? There he is. Um, Joe has uh, um, uh, been working uh, in a very uh, distinguished way uh, for many, many years, has written uh, a wonderful abstract algebra book, uh, was a, um, uh, a HAMO award winner, um, has uh, um, worked uh, um, in a variety of, uh, of venues, but probably the most important thing that he's done, at least as far as I'm concerned, is his, uh, is his summer camp for, uh, for sort of grown-up students, for, for c the uh, Duluth program for undergraduates. Um, but I'm going to let Joe continue the story. Um, Paul said about something like the vague charge of this, of this panel. <laughs> anyway, uh, just to show how vague it is, I did prepare a talk over the weekend, uh, last past weekend for this session here. And about 11.30 today, I went upstairs to completely scrap that talk and write up a new one because I thought the original talk I prepared was probably not appropriate. Um, so what I thought I'll do instead is sort of react to some of the comments I've heard earlier today and, um, and just make a few comments about them. Like, Mark Saul said something to this effect, I'm paraphrasing, competitions are a great way, or I'm not sure who said this, Some, competitions are a great way to identify and develop talent. I certainly agree to, with that, and, but I asked the following question, to what end? And I think you should ask yourself the same question. And there might be many ends, but the end I'm interested in is this. I'd like to see these programs help develop research mathematicians. It's like the entry, it's the starting point. To take talented people, get them excited, get them started early, and hope that they'll become research mathematicians and make a contribution to knowledge. So that's, that's the goal I like to talk about. And another comment that was made today um, by, I think it was, I'm not sure who made this point. Oh, uh, maybe it was Mark Saul who made this point too, I'm not sure. But in any case, critical, yeah, he has an NSF grant, critical transition point. <laughs> <laughs> er, and, 
I, I mean, he gives the grants, and I think this is one of his areas. You could get a grant for this. You could get a grant for this. Okay, all right. All right. Well, that's kind of interesting because that's exactly what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this transition point, and there's a couple transition points that I address. One is the difference between going from college, undergraduate a math major, to a graduate school, and there's also a transition point from competition problems to research problems. And this point was also addressed by Alexander Seufer. He mentioned somebody said Kolmogorov or somebody said a competition problem takes five hours and these take 5,000 hours. I don't agree with that, but in any case, this is what I'm interested in this transition. And I claim REUs, research experience for undergraduate programs, are a great way to bridge these two gaps here. And, um, and this is where I've been, I started my first REU in 1977 and I've been going ever since. In fact, there's five people in this building that were in my RE programs. Laney Wood is one, Karan Svesda, and uh, anyway, um, so, so this is what I know about and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. Now, um, what I consider REUs is, there's about six of these running across the nation now in one form or another. There's some REU programs and what I call REU-like programs, like the NSA runs and they don't call it REU, but that's what it really is, and they have like 30 students in theirs every summer, and that's the biggest one. But I claim it takes students to the next level and what I mean about that is it, it takes them from either being doing well in courses or doing well in competitions to, to doing original research. And the great thing is it's, it's really an introduction to the profession. Uh, taking you know, even advanced courses at the best schools don't really tell you what a research mathematician does, a professional mathematician does. And certainly solving competition problems is not what research mathematicians do. But these REUs, if they're run well, they do this. They introduce the student to what a real mathematician does. Well, quickly, they, what do they do? Of course, they solve problems, but these are original problems, research problems, and this is what competitions usually don't do. People in competitions, they solve the problem and then go to another problem, and then another problem, and the problems usually aren't related. But in RU programs, you solve a problem, but then you pose other problems, related problems. Now that you solve this problem, what other problems does that suggest? Not the, the, the problem you already solved, can you use those techniques to do other things? And, and so it's a much more, it's a higher level activity than just competitions. And then of course you have to write up a paper and I require my students to tech it, it's latex, it has an introduction, it has an abstract, it has an acknowledgement section, it has a bibliography and it's well written and you know, it looks good, it looks like a professional paper. In fact, very often uh, when these students uh, that go through my program get referees reports, occasionally the referee will make some remark like, um, I had no inkling whatsoever that this was written by an undergraduate student until they came to the acknowledgement. But up until that point, they thought it was written by a professional. So this is another thing that, this is why I say it's the next level. And then of course, I require my students to not just, you do everything that professional mathematicians do. So after you write your paper, you want to communicate your results in other ways. Like for example, my students are going to be at the Atlanta meeting, at the joint annual meeting. So I say, show up at the joint meeting and give a talk. And by the way, I'm strongly against, if you go to these meetings nowadays, they have a special session for undergraduate research. I'm strongly against my students going into there because I want them to be in the, with the pros. If, if somebody, if Laney writes a paper on number theory, she should be in with a number theorist. If somebody writes, a, if Svezda writes a paper on combinatorics, she should be in with the combinatorials, not in with the, see the undergraduate sessions, the first talks on differential equations, next talk on statistics, next talks on graph theory, next talks on modeling, and it's all over the map. The pros don't show up for those, it's just other undergraduates. But I, I want my students to learn what a professional does. And after their talk, the professional should come up and say, I like what you did. Do you have any preprints? And what did you think of this? And, and so that's, that's the big advantage of that. And then this is a grueling thing, this, what I call the publication process. It's ridiculous in the math community how long it takes to get a paper refereed. Um, Max Maydansky is here somewhere. He submitted a paper a year and a half ago and still hasn't heard anything yet one way or another. And he's written to the editor and saying, what's happening with my paper? And even worse, suppose his paper's rejected. He waited maybe two years and got a rejection. This is a lifetime for a young student. And uh, like one of the students uh, that was in my program a year ago, his mother is a researcher in the field of medicine. And she says, if they don't hear back in four weeks, they're complaining to the editor. Anyway, um, so th this is what I mean by the publication process. You have to learn how to 
where to submit the papers, how to deal with the, with the delays, and, and then of course there's usually referees reports. And a lot of times students, they'll get a positive referees report, but they're not sure if it's accepted or rejected. They'll say to me, I don't know if it's accepted or not. And the reason they don't know if it's accepted is they ask for a few changes here and there. Well, they're not, I say, they're not going to ask you to make all these changes if they're going to reject it. They're asking you to make these changes because they're interested in publishing it. But, but they have to learn this somehow, and that's where they learn it. Um, now, another thing I, I like competition problems, even though I'm not good at it. I, I wouldn't even get a 20 on the Putnam exam, let alone a 100 like some of these students do. But nevertheless, um, there's a big difference between competition problems and research problems. To me, competition problems, are, they're an end in themselves. The goal was to solve that problem and then move on to another one. But of course, a research problem is just the beginning. You're just getting started. And, and, and here you're making a contribution to knowledge. So what I'm urging you to do is, Get the students start with the competition problems, get them excited, and help them develop their skills, and then move them on to these, to these research problems. Um, now, a, a huge difference, like that comment about the 5,000 hours, I mean, I, 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 don't, I shouldn't take that literally, but the, the big difference between research problems is that they're open-ended. Like, a lot of times I just give somebody a problem and I'll say, well, see what you can do with this idea. I'm not giving them a conjecture. I don't, I don't give them an inequality and say, improve this bound. I mean, I do that sometimes, but I mean, the ideal problem is, here's an idea, see what you can do with it. In fact, there's a student in my program about two years ago, David Arthur. In fact, I think his father's maybe president of AMS now or president of Elector. Arthur? Represent yeah, is he president now? Nope. Coming up. Okay, this is the son. In any case, I like what he said. We don't know who the president is? Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> yeah, I know him too. <laughs> but I didn't know when his term ended. In the, yeah, yeah, right. It, it's just, okay, I, I wasn't sure when his term was up. But in any case, this student did something that was really nice. I gave him a problem, and at the beginning of the program, I give each student a problem, and then like the next week they come, each student works individually. And the next week they come in and they tell us what they did. They tell us and the rest of the students and the, the people that are there. And David Arthur got up, and I had given him a problem having to do with arc width of a graph. It doesn't matter what it is. I can't remember myself. But in any case, he says, my problem is to understand arc widths of graphs. I said, that's a great way to phrase it, because that's what I wanted him to do. In other words, I don't want him to solve this particular conjecture or find the arc width of this particular graph. I want him to understand the notion and give him the freedom to do what he wants with it. And that's what he did, and he did a great job. So to make a long story short, my message to you people here, the people that are involved with competitions <laughs> is that once the competitions are over, once you've done your job, I think you should encourage them to participate in REUs. There are 60 of them, and especially my REU. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. The, our uh, next speaker is Harvey Keynes, also from Minnesota. Um, they, we had sunny weather specifically for our, our friends from uh, Minnesota and Nebraska. <laughs> and um, and uh, um, Harvey has been, uh, is, a, um, has, is a professor at, at the University of Minnesota, but has been active for at least 20 years in uh, uh, K-12 uh, educational act, um, outreach, um, especially uh, related to two things, the Geometry Center and uh, I do you, can you pronounce the acronym? The, uh, up the ump. Um, <laughs> up the ump, the University of Minnesota Talented Youth Mathematics Program. Um, so uh, um, this is, a, again, a, a completely differ different audience. So uh, let's, let's hear what Harvey has to say. Thank you. Well, you do me an honor. You said 20 years is actually 35 years that I've been involved in it. <laughs> And actually, the start, once again, had to do with um, something in Berkeley. Anybody remember Project SEED? Special Education for the Elementary Disadvantaged. Elementary Disadvantaged. I mean, think about that. And um, back in 1968 or 69, for those of us who didn't go over to Vietnam and felt a social consciousness, a lot of us got involved in SEED. And I went and actually taught in SEED for a year. And it was one of the most profound things I did. Being in a fifth grade classroom and teaching in that for a year really changed my views. And I, I, I think I'd like to just acknowledge that type of thing. Well, as Joe said, we're, or Paul said, we're both from Minnesota, except I would claim we have two different aspects. Joe has his REU, and he imports people into Minnesota only for the summer. I have umpty-ump, and people are dismayed. I export 
students out of Minnesota. And actually the fact that I was exporting students has really been a good thing to make my school more cognizant of the program and what we did. So when I was giving this talk, you know, I saw the word circle and I tried to think, where would I put umpty umpiness? First I thought fat circle, x to the 2 n, but eh, ellipse. Then I decided it's really a connected continuum that has no particular shape to it. It's just a glob, but it is a circle of some kind. And so let me give a little history about umpty up. Now, because uh, we do have a time constraint, I am going to slap on very busy slides, and most of them you will only see one or two things out of it, and you'll say they're complicated, but I will give you a website where you can take a look um, and get more information. Now, what was the history of umpty -ump? So the idea of starting the University of Minnesota Talented Youth Mathematics Program was very simple. In the late 60s and early 70s, here we were in Minnesota. It's a state that has a very, very deep sense of education and equity and never could get itself together to have a special schools for academically oriented kids, although it did change in some sense, but definitely not in math and science. And a group of us at the University of Minnesota said, we came from that history, Bronx School of Science, Stuyvesant, Central High in Philadelphia, Boston Latin, all these schools where you had these concentrations, what could we do to deal with that? And starting from that history, we tried to develop a program that could answer that, at least in mathematics. And that is the origins of the umpty -ump program. The umpty -ump program, in, in some ways, uh, started with the uh, program that was presented today, the um, uh, program for a, a Center for Talented Youth trying to identify students. And at one time, we used the SATs as a screener, but we've moved on in many ways and moved out of that. And it's a fairly vast and large program. And what I'd like to do is tell you some of the issues that are involved, not really give you a lot of answers. And I'm really glad that I came on at this time because many of the issues that other speakers have raised on culture, identity, follow-up, what do you teach the kids, what's the message, are all sitting in our program all at once. And that's what makes it complicated. Here is our page snapshot of it. And you see the size of it. It's big. 508, excuse me, let me get this. 500, you think I'm going to, yeah, okay. 508 students involved in many different uh, classes. We have the composition there. Um, you see um, uh, the issues. Now, uh, among the issues you basically see there is the one thing that we have done fairly well in dealing with equity is our female student population. And a program like this, as large as it is, with sort of we don't have an open admission. There is a screening test of things. The fact that we have been able to keep a population of about a third of our students to be females and how they go through there uh, has been a, a struggle, but we've been made to do it. And they're absolutely outstanding students. The vast majority of the programs in the Twin Cities, 400 students in a variety of classes, and I'll explain them. And now, again, what is, it's a program. It's a program that admits students when they're ready to start studying, if you like, algebra, high school program, and it stays with the students until they go off to college. Now, when you're dealing with kids this talented, that does not mean they finish calculus. It means you stay with them to the point that they leave and go on to higher education. And that's actually quite a challenge. Um, we had one student when she graduated our program um, because of a special program in Minnesota called the post-secondary option, which in one of its more enlightened times, Minnesota's not quite as enlightened now, but in one of its more enlightened times, they had a program which allows students in their last two years of high school to come in and replace their high school education by a college education. It's a real fine for people who can deal with it. She took advantage of that, and when she left our program, she had 162 credits towards a degree at the University of Minnesota. Those were quarter credits. She needed 18 more. And I regard it one of the marks of education that we did. She rejected all those credits and went on to Caltech and started over as a freshman because she wanted to study some more things. And when I tell that to people, this audience might appreciate it. Others would say, what? You gave up 162 credits? I say, ah, but look at the education she gained. 
So one of the things we're trying to do is not just have a credit mill. We're trying to have something which educates students to be a real, uh, to deal with their education in a deep thing. Um, many of our students finish our entire program, our five-year program, by in the time they're sophomores in high school. And they will spend two more years, sometimes even three, at the University of Minnesota. And one of the good things, one of the unique things about our program is it's really based at a university. It's not a university host. It's really based at a university. It is a university program. And it took the university about 20 years to warm up to this. But one day they discovered these are really good kids on our campus. And they really came to the conclusion, the export problem, that these kids, by and large, are not going to come to school at the University of Minnesota if the University of Minnesota treats them like other students. And as a result of that, there's been a whole host of special opportunities and uh, situations for our students that the university hosts, which to its credit has worked very well. They now capture about 25 to 30 percent of our students voluntarily go there, turning down better schools because of some of the culture issues that are in there. The most predominant school that our students go to when they graduate, the three most popular are MIT, Caltech, Chicago, Stanford, and um, by the way, Berkeley is coming up. As, I, I left off the U of M because it is one of the five most, but I put that, you're right, five, four most popular. Uh, and because it has a special role. Um, MIT told us that of all the students that they take from the state of Minnesota, about two-thirds come from our program. So we send two out of every three students. See that? I knew I'd get it fired up. All right. Is that it? A hell of a false alarm. Okay. All right. This um, means change the slide. Yeah, I think I... <laughs> get it off. All right. There we go. Right. Thank you. Um, right. So let me talk a little bit about the program. The program, um, as I said, is a program, and it basically has a sequence of five courses, two of which we call high school, three of which we call college. They're calculus courses. The idea, though, is I call it a program rather than a set of courses because the courses are all interconnected, and we very much worry about what is the education of our students going to look like. So the courses are not to get you quickly engineering credit if you happen to go to the University of Minnesota Institute of Technology, but what can we do to educate them? So our courses are fairly unique. It really plays a lot on the native intelligence of the students. The approaches that we've put in together in our calculus are very much dictated by the views of the faculty and the people teaching it and what's important. Our calculus is a heavily geometrically based calculus. And that's because all of us feel that's the kind of intuition the students learn, and they really, really enjoy it. And I will give you a little more details about those courses, just quickly again, because I don't really have a lot of time, and I know we're playing with this. Um, the course is described, by the way, if you want any more information, right at the top, www.itsep.umn.edu will get you all this information. This is straight printed off of that. Um, Basically, as we said, the courses consist of, the, the actual content sounds fairly standard. Calculus 1 and Calculus 2 are basically single and multivariable calculus uh, together with a linear algebra course. Calculus 3 basically finishes a course in what I would call uh, a vector analysis or, um, you know, what I, calculus and geometry would be the best term. And what we did, because the students continue going on, is we have an advanced topics course, which is a transition course. And that's become a very interesting course that we've been dealing with, that each year a faculty member will pick up a topic that they think is an important topic and say, this is a way to transition students into moving into regular upper division coursework at the U or wherever they're going and teach them a little more of the rigor and proof that we deal with that. And that course has had a variety of topics in it. Uh, this, the last two years they've been combinatorics and graph theory. We've had courses in topology in there. We've had courses in probability in there. We actually had a course in computational algebraic geometry. And uh, Vic Reiner, who several people may know, 
use that course as a model to build an upper division course for our program. So these kids are really engaged in some high level stuff. Um, here again is a brief description of the courses that show you more or less how they work. And um, you'll notice, so people wrote out about problem solving versus proofs. Yeah. All of our course talk about we're going to emphasize concepts and formal reasoning. And it's a challenge. Let me talk about our Calculus 1 this year, just to show you the challenge of that. Our Calculus 1 course this year at the Twin Cities campus has 88 students in it. Okay, let me give you the age distribution of them. Now, these are the brightest kids. The age distribution, we have three kids in the seventh grade. That is, they're seventh grade levels and they're in Calculus 1. 16 in the eighth grade, nine, uh, 39 in ninth grade, 10, uh, 26 in the 10th grade. So the oldest student in there is a 10th grader and the range is from 7th grade to 10th grade. Now, for those of you who teach these kids on a regular basis, there's a maturity issue you really have to worry about. You saw a little bit of it, if you, those of you who are watching the demonstration here, the kids over here were doing a lot less than the kids over there and there's about two years of difference. And that kind of maturity issue is a real, how do you design a program that will get a kid in the seventh or eighth grade, think about when you were at that age, into actually understanding calculus at a somewhat rigorous level? What do you do? What do the classes look like? What is the type of thing that's going to keep them in there? We must be doing something right because we did just finish the first semester of that course with the 88 students. And of the 88, 85 finished and are going on to the second semester. So um, we don't get that by just going up there and giving good lectures. You really have to get into how students learn and some of the things that are involved in what's doing with them. And that goes on. And the other classes go on. Actually, you watch a lot of maturity. When you run a program like this, a student here and a student here are worlds apart, even though they're two years older because it's not only the maturity that occurs from age, but you see a tremendous amount of mathematical maturity. It's actually one of the really gratifying things to watch them come in as these big, I feel like a drill sergeant. You know, I tell the first year students, I'm your drill, mathematical drill sergeant. You know, you're going to hate me, you're going to think this is ridiculous, but then look two years down the road at the kids that are really happy and pleased. And we really do see a lot of growth in that. So it's a real interesting challenge to teach this. Um, the faculty who teach it are postdocs. We have graduate students. Now that's turned out to be one of our great trainers is the graduate students really kill to get in to be a workshop leader on this and it's really helped them in their training. And so this has become something that really makes a difference in the school and the way it functions. And not only that, it gets people interested in working with talent. I better get that slide off. There we go. Put it back on. Something magic about, you know, when I get into these too long. Okay, I promise to get that one off. Um, <laughs> it worked? Pull it off. Okay. Um, the, what, what this has become, this program, is a real professional development opportunity for both faculty and graduate students. And I think this is important. Uh, people talked about training high school teachers. It is not the case that a lot of college people know how to work with students at this level. And to have an opportunity like this is, I think, a good thing and one of the things I would like to advertise for it. Well, okay, what do the students look like? So in the end, after I've sold all this, what do they look like and what are some of their accomplishments? Well, as you would expect, they're good in contests. Okay, they're good in contests. Um, this is a partial count in all the contests. I didn't even kind of put the full count in here. Let me give a... Um, Another measure that might even give you a, a more interesting indicator of where they are. Uh, where we live, there's something called the North Central Math Regional Contest. I believe there's seven or eight states involved in a couple Canadian um, provinces. And they send 60 teams to a competition. Okay, it's a college competition. The University of Minnesota's had 18 students involved in six different teams. Seven of those students were in our program are graduates. So we contribute half of the competition level to U of M to that program. The team that finished fifth had one of our students as one of the members. 
But more impressively, the team that finished six was all high school students. So this group of high school students, high school juniors and seniors, I think there was even a, a sophomore in there, finished six out of 60 teams in a college competition. They're good students and they really take to problem solving. However, once again, while they're doing the problem solving, we're always counseling them on the comments that Joe and other people said, we're here to teach you how to be mathematicians and to think mathematically. Competitions is part of it, that's not the name of the game. And so we worry as, as much about their education as anyone else's. When these kids are bright, they're very bright. This is their music achievements. Okay, now take a look at that. Their music achievements equals their math achievements. As a matter of fact, when I write letters for many of them, I don't know what to write about, their music achievement or their math. I mean, these are very, very rounded students. So we can't look at their education as give them, give them math, give them math, let them go away. They do lots and lots of things. I actually write letters for a lot of them, and I look at their vitas and I say, I ought to send them to some of our graduate students to have them deal with that. Now that's a positive, it's also a negative. The negative is these kids are over-programmed like mad by their families because they're so talented. And we have to talk about that all the time. What does it take to do mathematics? How much effort can you be the greatest musician, a state athlete, do mathematics, study Latin, and go to Harvard and do this all when you're a sophomore? No, it's okay to slow down. So we do have these issues of dealing with that kind of culture in there. Um, let me just give you a little bit of a background of some of our graduates so I can tell you a little bit. So we did a recent survey. We've had about 500 alums over the past. We started having alums in 85, so it's about, I guess, about 15 or 16 years. The most recent 96 alums that we surveyed had degrees in 2001, 2003. Of the 96, they achieved about 145 majors. That is, they graduated with a degree in that major. And one of the issues that the NSF always likes to know is how many SMET degrees, not SMUT, SMET, S-M-E-T, SMET degrees are students achieving? Well, our students on an average achieve 1.3 SMET degree per student. That is, the 96 students had achieved 126 degrees in science, math, engineering, or technology, or an average of 1.3 SMET degree per student. Okay, that's kind of a stupid one. Let me give you the important one. Of the students, 31 got degrees in mathematics. That's about 32 percent. Now, I think to us that's a real statement of, of real interest that about a third of our students, after going through our program, are achieving degrees in mathematics at very fine schools and most of them are going on to graduate school. So the edict that Joe said about getting them interested in staying, that's our real goal in life. Uh, some of the other successes I want to talk about, we've had two Rhodes Scholars. Many have faculty positions in very good universities. As a matter of fact, one of the graduates of our first class got tenure two years ago at the University of Minnesota is one of our superstars. So uh, I'm really Glad to see that that's coming back. Well, how do you get students for this program? Do we just hang out our shingle and everyone signs up? No. As a matter of fact, the biggest thing is to attract. If we did hang out our shingle and wait for people to come, we wouldn't get the demographics we're looking for. And so what we've built is a total program, that's a set of enrichment programs. Notice the grade level, 3 to 12. Our research says if you're going to get that kid to think about coming in in grade seven or eight, you start in grades three or four, programs to get people interested. And in some sense, I will say to you right now, more so because of what the situations are in many of the public schools. They're not encountering these types of opportunities unless we set them up. So we have a complex set of Saturday uh, programs that we start for grades three to 12. And I would, if you looked at our female population, which you might say could be better, if we did not have this program, our, fa our female population would be half of what it is. This is the program that gets a lot of our female and underrepresented minorities into it. So if you want to have a program that meets that, you have to do something to support them in the front end. What about the back end? Well, 
We talk about REUs. I'll be finished in a second. We also said, what can we do for their general education? What can we do to make education for these students really something else? And we came up with a math seminar series this year. And the idea is to introduce these students to a variety of interesting math topics at the level that they can understand it, but at a real level about real problems. And we've put this together for the first year or two. I keep on having a little bit of, all right. Anyway, a lot of our faculty now are overjoyed. It was oversubscribed with faculty to come and talk about what they could do to come in with a program that basically uh, could be reachable to a kid who just finished a year or two of calculus and yet has some real uh, depth to it. And you can see some of the topics we've put together. Some of the faculty that are doing it is our chairman, uh, Larry Gray. Uh, we did the four color problem, which is very popular. We're doing some things on symmetry, curvature, and computer vision. We're never doing anything that's just applied without a mathematical flavor. It's none of this here's where mathematics is used. No, here's mathematics and one of the uses of it is this. But we never bury the mathematics for the use. So I think I've run out of my time and that's a, uh, uh, a short, without a, uh, without, a buzzer, I mean, without a buzzer, that's a short thing. Thank you very much. Oops. Our uh, final speaker in, in this session is uh, Walter Mienka, who is based in Nebraska, but he's probably traveled more than just about anyone in here uh, all over the world. And uh, he, he's been a professor since 1970, I think, at, at, at uh, Nebraska, and uh, went to, to UMass. And, uh, um, and, and the, uh, um, among, well, among the many honors he's had, is, uh, from my point of view, the most Im important ones have been uh, his stewardship of the American math competitions for about 22 years, 23 years from uh, pretty much 1975 or 76 until 98, 99, right around then. And, uh, and uh, Walter was the executive director of IMO 2001 and uh, is a, an, was an Erdős winner, was a, got the Paul Erdős Award from the World Federation of National Mathematics Competitions in recognition of his role in uh, the development of mathematical challenges at the national level uh, and as a stimulus for the enrichment of mathematics learning. So uh, Walter, let's hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. You can't hear me yet. How about now? You better? I have a preamble for this presentation, and that is this. Number one, um, last October, I had a birthday, and I'm now 16. Yes, the sum of the digits of my age is 16, so now you know how old I am. As a consequence, when you reach sweet 16, you have certain privileges. You can get a license to do almost anything you want. So one of the things I can do because of my age is to be a bit immodest. And I apologize for that in this pre presentation. I have three occurrences uh, in this place called Berkeley. The uh, first one is Professor Lamer invited me to be a research scholar here in the 60s. And that was a particular interesting period because I walked by the student union one day. And by the way, I could only use the computer at 1 o'clock in the morning during that era. Uh, there was a person in front of, the, in front of the student union speaking to about five people. The next day, 25 people. The next day, 50 people, his first name is Savio. And that was the era I was here. Quite an inter interesting time. 
the next occurrence is uh, Edith May Slife, taught at Emeryville. And as you know, the Slife Award is given to the top uh, teachers that the American Mathematics Competitions identified. And I visited Edith once. And there's a, I think there's a hotel nearby here. And uh, in the middle of the night once, I, the ceiling starts going in circles. And I didn't know what to do. I just froze. It didn't collapse. There's some omens about my visit here because yesterday I heard, and it's quite ironical that we have such a group here, that within three miles of here, down Telegraph Avenue, in the city of Oakland, there's a meeting to decide to close seven schools. Seven schools. Now, um, we have a Terminator who's now the governor. <laughs> I hope that this doesn't happen. But most of the students who were, I saw this on TV, and parents who were protesting this were students of what we call of minority origin. Students who needed to have the school. Yet here we are looking at a particular branch of students and hoping to train them. We hope that works out all right. I thought I would today, um, well, before I go on, I'll just tell you the story in order to keep in good uh, graces with Paul. The story about a speaker who was speaking away, and time went by, and the moderator became very concerned, and then the moderator raised his gavel, and just as he came down, the head fell off and hit a young lady in the first row, and she uh, was knocked out. People ran over to revive, revive her, and she did revive, and she said, um, hit me again, he's still speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to be within the time frame here. To compliment the, my predecessors here, I want to um, first give you a title to my presentation. And it's this. We all know that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. I'm not, telling, I'm not referring to the fact that all insects have six legs, four wings, head, body, and thorax, and two antenna. But a good example of this, in case you're a little rusty in its connotation, is the house fly. And if you ask most people, they will say the house fly has only two wings. But in fact, originally the house fly had four wings. And if you look closely below, below the four wings, Thank you very much. Right. Some of the results carried forth. In fact, a good prime example would be David Hilbert. And you, of course, know, getting back to Joe's talk here, it was more than problem solving. He actually gave us problems. And of course, David, you all know, there he is. 
just in case. You can't see him. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. There he is. <laughs> Gave us. And you all, of course, have memorized all the problems. And there they are. They're not quite up to date, what's been done. But these are problems that have been posed, different kind of problems, but yet they led to a tremendous amount of research. Quickly, just to review what they are. There they are right there. And there they are right here. Paul says to speed it up. <laughs> and of course, you know the most recent problems are available to all, everybody. Everybody, OK. But remember, the ontogeny, recapitulation, phylogeny, they're going to be solved because of the basis of fundamental knowledge given to people by others from which to spring. So, um, And every one of the students that you see with a flick of the wrist here is involved in the IMO. And remember, there was great trepidation about whether or not we should send a team. We've been sending a team for 30 years. But the function has been going on for 45 years. Nora Turner argued for it. And Maury Clamkin. Sorry. He certainly fills the role of someone we can say was an ontological person. And even the latest issue of the math magazine, he had some problems. You notice that? Murray. Mm -hmm. And there's Paul Zeitz up here. He not only was on the team, he was a USAMO winner that year. So I'm not sure. Yes, we started in 74. There are the sites. They'll probably be available later. OK. And my first exposure to the uh, IMO was in Poland. Not because my father was from Krakow, but I thought I should visit the country. And there's our team. You recognize some of the names. David Gravener from the local area here. Joseph Keane, and so on. Lefkowitz, I'll come back to this in just a moment. Here, come on. Here they are, all the people, and their medals. All right. Okay, Romania. Okay. Read from the bottom to the top. Korea. Rank third, <coughs> USA ranked second, Scotland ranked, Japan ranked third, Scotland ranked second, and of course you know what wonderful performance they did last year in Athens. And here's the overall rankings of all the teams here plus the ones I mentioned to you. All right. So Nora was right. Sam Greitzer was helpful. Uh, Cesar Rousseau was going to be the new, I understand, USAMO leader, committee chair, no, was very helpful. They all, their influence and the influence of all the people here certainly fit, fit the role of the statement, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Getting back to Joe's wonderful program, he mentioned the word writing. Let me give you an example of what happened at the IMO in Hong Kong. Let me show you exact copies of the papers of our six students in problem number one to show how important it is to be able to write. I'm glad you made that statement. Here is the problem number one. with the official solution. Very fast. 
Now, very quickly, as you know, the three questions will be solved in nine hours. Here's a solution of key member number one. Ay, 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 ay. He didn't go to Joe's program. <laughs> <laughs> Still goes on. Okay, number one. I won't tell you who it is, but I will tell you this story was very sad with this ending. Tito knows who it is and some others. How about that solution? That's a Joe solution. That's a Tito solution. That's a, our training program solutions. That's the way you teach your students at the training program. Sometimes it works. How about that solution? It's very critical to be able to, to, be able to write. And so on. I won't have to show it them all. I think you get the idea. Okay. So that's very, very important. That first step in your training program, Sesta knows that too, to teach these students how to write. Uh, just as a little footnote, in case you don't remember. Here are the results of the teams in Hong Kong. The team points. And in case you haven't seen this, here, this cartoon. News item, this is from the North Carolina newspaper. News item. U.S. match team defeats 68 other countries in the international competition. We're number one. The trouble is, soon thereafter, this person had to follow it immediately the next day. It's been brought to our attention that Friday's cartoon contained a math error. <laughs> uh, this proves three things. Durham home of many well-educated people, is the home of many well-educated pe people, people. Two, those people have a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> One, two, four, the, car the cartoonist grade school math teachers were right all along. <laughs> Anyways. Let me um, show you a, a profile here of some of the students, and very quickly on these slides. They reconstructed it. Old Town Warsaw. And see our team members walking. Remember, IMO is not just a competition. IMO is for the students to meet other students. Exchange. And there's our team. Cecil Rousseau on the left. Samuel Greitscher below. Someone to his right. Look at the second person to the left. Cecil Rousseau. Greg Protruno and Lefkovich. Something happened to him. He went to Caltech but dropped out and something happened. And there they are. Number one. Well, I thought it fitting for our team to Oh, by the way, Joseph King from Pittsburgh received the special prize. There's great argument about this from someone, but he won the special prize. 
I thought it would be fitting for our team to alternate with the Russian team because it was a tie for number one. I'm not sure if anybody recognized those students, but... And I had to get the KGB agent in there. It's always a woman for some reason. <laughs> really. Then Zelina followed her. Well, that's a different story. All right. Takes many people. Now, I want to take a few moments. We're now in Australia, and this is a crucial period of someone in this room's life. Someone who helped organize this conference, and I won't tell you her name. <laughs> um, because of circumstances, she almost didn't make the Bulgarian team. Not because she didn't want to, but we won't get into that detail. It turned out, she told me later, that she was ill the first day of the exam. It turned out that one of our team members, Jordan Ellenberg, from Maryland, was also ill. And they <coughs> met each other. I'm not sure. Illness breeds illness, I guess. Okay. But according to, the, uh, according to what she said, it's because of Jordan who urged her to apply to come to the United States. And we're so grateful for the addition to our wonderful group. That's uh, here. That's our Australian group. Now let's go to China. Opening ceremonies. Look at that beautiful color, the elegance of this. What, what's going on in the minds of our participants? I asked our guide why they built the Great Wall. He said, um, to keep the people out. I said, well, I heard it's to keep the Chinese in. <laughs> OK. Do you recognize Karen in there? China. Closing ceremonies. It never moves. <laughs> the organizers. And there's a closer look up. Karen, you haven't changed. <laughs> Joy Hoyer, direct paternal leader and deputy. I, In Lincoln, we just built two $50 million high schools, set to last 50 years. I never understood that part of it. Beautiful blackboards, beautiful everything else. This is China. We generally are number one and number two. Look at those blackboards. Look at the floor. Look, it has nothing to do with it. There used to be an actress called Mae West. After one of her performances on Broadway, she came out. And a young reporter said to her, goodness, May, where'd you, get all those, where'd you get all those diamonds? She said, son, goodness had nothing to do with it. Classrooms have nothing to do with it. It's you people, period. Come on, look at that geometry. These are Samuelsons who are going to host the IMO in Sweden the next year. And there's our Swedish team. You recognize anybody there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here Lenny Ng. OK. Final banquet. Sorry about this digression. You know, Linnaeus, Linnaeus, excuse me, Linnaeus, L-I-N-E-A-U-S, was the one who classified <coughs> all plants. Remember your botany? This is his home in Sweden. I had to take this picture. Remember you took botany? How to classify? OK, enough of this. River trip in Sweden. And I collect antique clocks, but I couldn't get this on the plane. These, this is the um, Russian leader and deputy and the KGB agent. They invited me to a cocktail party, a, a, a quiet one. Because, but they're going to host it the next year. And there it is. Russia. 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 Wonderful.
Turkish leader, uh, executive director, and here's our team in Turkey, and Hudson, Cesar Rousseau. Okay. Turkey. These are the leaders designed the exam. And here's our team in Hong Kong. <laughs> Noam Shazir, Alexander Kazanov, Who's the next one, T2? Stephen Wong. Wong. Jonathan Weinstein, Jeremy Bim, I think who's here. And then Jer Jacob Laurie. All right. All right. Oh, let's go back on that one. P2. Now, I want you to pay heed to this picture. Note of Jacob Lowry. He's the only one that didn't work in a shirt, shirt and tie. And notice Stephen Wong, look at your shoes. <laughs> Stephen left his shoes on the bus. So they exchanged shoes. One tennis shoe and one regular shoe. <laughs> Actually, it was, it was Noam. It was Noam and, and Stephen. Yeah. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Look at them. I, I confess, I, I have to reveal that Alexander um, met with an unti untimely death. At, uh, uh, he was a good citizen. I think you're about ready to pass out, but I'll, I'll say a few words here. I can't believe that we, in our profession, do so much on a volunteer basis. I must say things have changed somewhat because the departments are recognizing your work. Look at the IMO 2001. Look at these pages of volunteers here. It's incredible. Certainly, remember the words, and you're part of the ontogeny that recapitulates phylogeny. Thank you very much. So, uh, does this work? I don't think it does. Does it? Yeah. It is on? It's, uh, I can't hear. When I tap it, it doesn't seem to make a sound. Um, so, well, even though we tried, we're still running uh, uh, behind schedule, and we have uh, students here that are waiting uh, to, uh, um, to do a, uh, a another, a s another uh, circle presentation, this time for, for older people. So I think, even though I wanted to have uh, some uh, questions, I think maybe uh, the best thing would be to take, a, take five and then just start the, next, start the next session. So uh, we'll start at... Uh, uh, 415 sharp then. Thank you. <laughs>